any industry only survives if there's a there's a constant stream of young, inquisitive, confident talent coming through. Episode 144. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I spoke to James Tate, who is an architect, an author and educator. James was the winner of the internationally renowned RIBA and RIAS Silver Medals in 2008, and since then he's gained considerable experience as an architect, leading a broad spectrum of high-profile projects at some of the best practices in the UK. And uh, James is the author of a new book called Entering Architectural Practice, which is published by Rootledge. And the book is really, really fascinating. He's also authored the other, another book called The Architecture Concept Book, which was published by Thames and Hudson. And in this episode, we focus on the themes that were emerging from entering architectural practice. We discuss about the growing gap between education and practice and what education can be doing and university can be doing to bridge that gap better. And we also look at the roles and responsibility of how practice can be bridging that gap back to university and making architecture education more valuable and more integrated into what you do as a professional. There was a lot of very interesting topics that came up. We talk about some of the working conditions that uh, young architects face um, and some of the root causes of that. We look at the fees of architects and why that has an impact on um, the working conditions as well. And we also take a step back and look at the saturation of the architectural industry. We ask the question, are there too many architects? And if that's the case, what types of things could and shall we do about it? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? So there's a lot of, um, you know, James is quite brilliant at being able to paint a multi-perspective argument around these issues facing the industry at the moment. So um, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. We are providing a link as well for all of our listeners to listen uh, to purchase the book, which I will publish in the information um, from rootlitch.com. So sit back, relax and enjoy James Tate. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. James, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. Uh, keeping well and healthy and, yeah, just delighted to be here speaking to you today. Super. Now, you're an architect, you're an author, you're an educator, You've, you're the winner of the silver medal in t- back in 2008. And you've recently published a book, Entering Architectural Practice, which is published by Rootledge. You've got a number of other books as well, The Architecture Concept being um, another one. You're teaching up at the Macintosh, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I've been teaching there since uh, 2019. Um, so that's, that's given me a really great perspective. I, I spent, spent most of my time um, in practice after leaving architecture school as a student, obviously. And I think incorporating some teaching has, has really um, allowed me to, to see both sides of the, the coin. And I think actually having that experience, is, uh, experience was, was very in, instrumental in me being able to write the book, I think, with, with a, a bit of kind of nuance and, and, and balance, I think. Mm. So what inspired the book, the recent one, Entering Architectural Practice? I mean, I think, I think the idea probably actually germinated when I was a, a student yeah. um, I always remember, always remember when uh, I was in uh, architecture school and one of my, my studio tutors said what you do here is, is nothing like designing uh, real buildings in practice and, and I think that question just kind of stuck in my head and I wanted to know more about it um, and the minute I started the first job in, in practice I realised exactly what, what he meant. 
Um, there is a discrepancy between, I think, the, the anticipation of the role. So, so what, what, what you are asked to do in architectural school in preparation and the reality of the role. Um, and I think in my experience, the, the, in practice, the design process almost felt like a bit of a battle. Um, it was dominated by technical issues, legal concerns, budgets, and, and things like that, and things that you never get really introduced to fully um, in architecture school. So I think I really wanted to, to write a book which um, I suppose introduced students to the truths of the profession um, and also things that I wish I had known <laughs> before graduating, really. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of positive aspects of, of the book as well in terms of uh, the positive sides of practice. Um, and I think most importantly, the fact that as graduates, you kind of have to realise that what you're doing now isn't on paper. It's, it's, it's a real, real thing and it's got real implications. Mm. Um, and I think that really the, the successful realisation of the architectural ideas that, that you cultivate in architecture school can only really be uh, successfully realised if, if you're if you're practicing uh, yeah. these things well as well. So I think it, it was really it came from a kind of personal experience, and then the minute I started talking to people about about this discrepancy within the the, the architecture profession, it seemed like everyone had the same opinion as I did that that they weren't quite prepared for or what they were going to be doing in practice. So that, 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 was, that was really it. Why, why do you think there is such a huge discrepancy between this? There is this big gap between what's happening in education versus the role of what you do in practice. And it's because it has quite significant impacts, particularly when we're interested in talking about the fees or we're talking about the, the salaries of young architects and their kind of, you know, they are, they're very low. It's very difficult. Yeah. And you're coming out of a, a protracted, long design education and then going into a role which is then commanding a very small salary. And there's a reason for that because you're, because of this, you're not prepared to do what an architect practice, practice needs. Why do you think, why do you think this discrepancy has emerged? I, mean, I think, I think if you go into any, any industry, there'll be people who say that what what they were taught in in, in school um doesn't quite match up with reality but i do think in architecture it's it's the difference is particularly acute mm -hmm. um, in architecture um and i think it's because one i think it, it's, it's such a complex set of issues that you have to deal with and i think architecture school for me quite rightly focuses on on design because if you don't know how to design and what the what the principles of design are then you can't you can't implement them in practice so it, it has to focus on design but i think the, the problem the, the the discrepancy comes when actually practice i think is sometimes too concerned with whatever the the economic market is doing and and uh, providing more floor space for for people and maybe not thinking enough about about things that make a great architecture mm. but i think both practice and an architecture school are coming from kind of different uh, angles and what i would really like to see is that both practice and and education start to try and bridge that gap um, a bit more but i think it, it's it's not it's not an easy answer i think yeah. it, it, and it's something that i think um probably happened with the with the separation of the architect from the building trades um which kind of started to happen in, in the renaissance period so it stretches a long a long time back and then and then with uh, it was only really in the past 150 years or so that that architectural education was actually university Mm. university based it might, might even be less than that so i think um that separation has, has increased and i think what 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 really interested me there's there quite a few 
interviews in the book with with um, people um, such as Ken Gokuma and and uh, Jonathan Serdison, so people people who have, have made it to relatively uh, very very high in the pr profession, and they they actually explained the same concerns that that, that I had. So I think it it's something that that's became something that you have to kind of deal with. The architecture school potentially it, it effectively sets you up to think like an architect but not actually practice like an architect. Mm. And I think if there was more um, of life itself within the design studio, so budgets and, and maybe live builds and, and interaction with real clients and, and what they actually want, um, then I think that that could probably help uh, bridge that gap a bit more. That's interesting. You you point to the fact that this is actually a very old problem that kind of has its roots in the Renaissance. And there's an interesting part in the book where you're looking at this difference between polymaths and monomaths. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. can you explain what that concept is, and is this, is that related to what you're discussing here? I think so. I mean, I mean, the I suppose the term monomath um, in relation to an architect is that essentially uh, we produce the information that allows buildings to be, to be built. And on the face of it, that, that, that is quite a, a narrow uh, definition compared to, the, I suppose, the Renaissance idea of, of the architect. And I think architecture school still cultivates that image of, of the architect as, as polymath. Mm. Um, and I think that, that for me was one of the biggest Kind of shocks, I think, of entering practice was that you weren't exactly, you, you weren't really thinking about the wider world around you. You were, a, you were, you were laser focused on the task that you were asked to do, whether that be a detail, a schedule, or um, a, a, a image that you were asked to produce. It, it just seemed very compartmentalized in practice, whereas in architecture school, um, you are almost taught that the, the world is your oyster and, and you can explore it architecturally any way that you want. And, and it, you, I, I, I personally haven't found that at all in practice. So I think that's where, where the idea is, the idea of the architect is, as monomath is. And again, it's related to business. It's basically, effectively, uh, that is what the architect is commissioned to do. Mm the information to to uh, allow buildings to be built so anything that kind of takes you off that that task um, uh, like a polymath might might do and be involved in lots of different things can sometimes uh, derail that that main purpose I suppose it's, it's really interesting why why do you think that university focuses so heavily on the kind of polymath version of being an architect as opposed to what's what's required in practice and and, and the, i suppose one of the interesting things is that architectural education is very long like yeah. it's it's five years in university so it's five years of the most kind of important gestation period of an architect where you're setting the intentions you're setting the course direction of careers and ideas and and it's a very protected and incubated environment which is not necessarily dealing with in any kind of way what actually happens in a in a practice. I know some universities are are, are quite different, but what why do what why the the heavy focus on that in university and what does it need to be as long? Do you think? Well, I mean, I I think um, per personally, I I do think that that it is it is essential that that architects um, have a broad education. Mm -hmm. um, that they understand the wider world, and and uh, because if you don't understand the wider world and and, uh, and intimately, then then you won't be able to, to design for it. Um, but I think there needs to be a bit more reality, <laughs> um, potentially in the later years. I think I think those early three years of architectural education, as you say, um, are really important as a gestation period for you mm. to, to think um, like an architect. But I think the, the final couple of years, I, I think they could 
architecture schools, in my my opinion, in my experience, I think could potentially do more to to allow students to think about the the the, the approaches they have, the the interests they have, and actually how they might get them realised in practice. And I think that that's the thing that's missing. I'm I'm not for one second saying here that. Um, like some in the profession would like that architects should uh, architecture education should just purely prepare yeah. students for practice. For me, that that is a that is a that is a dangerous approach. Mm. But I think we have to introduce a bit more reality to make sure that that students um, can actually take those principles that they've learned and be able to. Put them in in practice because I think that that was the biggest thing for me as a student making that transition. I just felt like what we were being asked to do in architecture school was in many ways the exact opposite. And I think in the UK especially, um, the final year project tends to be the project where you are supposed to be a complete polymath. You're supposed to know um, you, you come up with a thesis project. I mean, my one thesis project I was effectively um, I, I became a bit of a, 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 a effectively a non entrepreneurial thing. It was about um, affecting rural communities. It was about creating a new industry around around a product, and then it was about designing a building. And I think I've I've always thought that maybe the thesis could be at the start of your 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 education to establish how you think and then you work out through the years how to get these ideas and in, into in practice because I went from designing a, a, a complete industry for an area of Scotland mm. to then doing like dormer windows and, and house extensions in, a, in, in the suburbs of, of Glasgow and it, it was just such a contrast um, that it was a bit of a shock to be honest. Yeah. And that's really interesting as well, because obviously at university, we, we do you get that opportunity to think on such a broad scale of topics. And also it's a completely self-directed, you know, projects, you're allowed to kind of indulge in all of your own personal interests. And then obviously the drop off when you come into practice is <laughs> right, here you go, here's door schedules for you for, for, for six months. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and also in practice, it's very easy to kind of get pigeonholed or you know, you enter into a certain um, niche stream of activity, you know, you know, you, you, you go into one practice and, you know, you start doing, you work, you start working on airport ceilings and then that's it. Now you're the, now you're the expert in airport ceilings for the next yeah. 15 years. So, and, and, and it seems, it seems it's such a stark contrast um, sometimes. It, you said earlier just then that um, you, you don't think, the role of university is to kind of solely prepare you for practice and that if universities went down that direction, that wouldn't be a useful kind of endeavor. What, why, why do you say that? Well, I mean, I think, I think the, there's definitely been, been a lot of grumbles in the profession that the students aren't, aren't prepared for, for the realities of practice. Um, and I would, I would tend to agree with that, but I think the, the, the problem is that I think our, the problem with that approach is that our kind of unique um, ability as architects, I think, within the construction industry is that we um, are the ones who, who are most able to, to put maybe more abstract ideas, um, so philosophical ideas, um, aesthetic ideas, um, ideas relating to a lot of the, the crises and, and uh, such as climate change and inequalities that we're dealing with, <clears throat> with a bit of perspective and having that wider, broader education, I think, allows us to, to maintain that role. Now, I think if architects were, if it was if effectively a finishing school for, like you say, uh, drawing airport ceilings and doing door schedules, then we wouldn't be architects. We would be um, technicians or, or yeah. uh, schedulers and, and things like that. So I think I think architecture school really has to still keep that ability to to develop architectural thinkers, 
Mm-hmm. But I think the bit, the bit that's missing is just how you take that architectural thinking and apply it in the real world. Um, so it's not it's not about training architects to become uh, producers of information. It's yeah. about making them understand what that information does in the wider context. Um, so I think I think you probably see from the book that I never quite I can I never quite take a black or white approach. I think it's such a complex issue that that um, and and again I, th- I think that's why I'm kind of thinking that that how we teach architecture students should be be flipped slightly. So you're not. In the final year, the the all seeing polymath, that maybe that is the stage to actually try mm. and transition into the realities of what what you do. But I think I think if we just trained people who could produce information, then we would be doing the history of of our profession um, yeah. a real disservice. I I was speaking to someone recently and they were discussing about the business model of universities and that university has its own business model and that the way that the current courses are set out serves that business model. So basically universities need to get bums on seats essentially. And yeah. therefore, and this is again, it's not a, a kind of necessarily an in, intentional misleading of students of what practice is like. And as you're saying that there's a lot of very you know, architectural thinking is kind of, that's why you do go to university is to think like an architect. And if we had, if we kind of stopped architectural thinkers, then we're just producing, you know, drafts people, but you know, there's, there's no need to go to university for that. But there's also this aspect of at university, um, you know, the business model for university is you, know, you need to have, you need, the schools need to encourage people to, to come to them and that yeah. actually selling design is easier to sell the practical aspects of a course. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would, I would say, I would say that's true. Certainly, of some of the more, uh, I suppose, experimental and radical, radical schools, potentially like like the the AA and and the Bartlett and places yep. like. That. But I think, I think that might get people in the door, mm-hmm. um, to, to study in a place. But I think the minute they get into practice they might feel slightly slightly cheeky and um, <laughs> but i think i think it's i think it, it's a it's a it's a real balance and um, i think that uh, it's important that essentially you have um students who are confident in their, their in what they've been taught that they can actually go out into the real world, and I don't know if that if that's a, that's a, the case right at, right at the moment. Yeah, um, and I'm not I'm not speaking about my own experience teaching or, or or any particular school. I think it's a wider issue as we, we've spoken about 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 just that that inherent discrepancy between what what you anticipate the role to be and what what the reality is. So I think I think um, that. Although, as you say, that having a, a, a design a, you know, reputation might, might bring people in. I think by the time they get to after their maybe part one um, in the UK anyway, um, they might think, well, I would have liked to have known a bit more about that. And I think, I think um, about the realities, and I think that that's, that's for me is the, the trick. Uh, is to make sure that you never lose sight of those those design ambitions and the things that that may draw students in, but you also um, combine them uh, with mm. what they're actually going to have to deal with. What, what do you think practice can do and the industry can do to bridge the gap and make it you know yeah. kind of ease the journey into the profession, if you like? I think there's a lot of things that practice could do, and I think I think actually there's probably more things that practice could do um, than than university, um, because I think I think one of the biggest things for me, and I've got kind of personal experience of this, is is that a lot of practices don't employ young architects 
to design. Um, sometimes they're, they're just there to produce information. And, and mm -hmm. if you've been if you've been taught for for seven years that, that you're going to design and then you spend three years in practice not doing that, then you're going to create some quite uh, disgruntled people, I think. Um, and obviously we've touched on on working conditions. I've got a whole section of the book dealing with how how I think the profession has to has to change in, in, in that sense. So I think I think it's about giving young architects more autonomy and decision making and not 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 um not letting them just fester away doing doing uh, production information and and also I think they have to um connect better I think with the architecture schools. I, I've always thought that there should be some sort of compulsory uh, placement thing because I know at the moment um they are there are, a lot, there are a lot of part one and part two students who can't get a job in, mm. in, the, in the profession that they have actually studied for and yeah. expected to get a job. And I think, I think there needs to be a, a closer relationship between practices and, and, and uh, architecture schools. And I think th there's good things that are happening at the moment. I think some, some schools do that. Um, and the, the school uh, I teach at do... Uh, do really well to, to try and maintain links with with practice um, and obviously there's there's the RIBA mentorship scheme that that's that's now coming in so it's definitely steps in the right direction but I think uh, creating a, a, a more synergetic relationship between themselves and and uh, and education would help but even on a wider term um, I think practices I've found because because you're so embroiled in the rush and the reality of of the project that that you're you're working on. There's not much time for reflection or experimentation, and those two things you get a lot of in architecture school, and I think yeah. that helps. Um, so, but then that probably comes down to the bigger issue of fees and yeah. and and whether there's enough space within your fee structure to actually be able to to provide that time and um, so yeah I, I think there's a lot that practice could do and um, to, to better improve the the experience of the students or the graduates that are, that are coming through and um, mm -hmm. but also to to improve their own practice as well i think any industry only survives if there's a there's a constant stream of young inquisitive a confident talent coming through um, and if, if that is either left to become dis, disgruntled or um, hushed in any way then it's only going to have a negative impact mm. on what we create as architects I think. I, I think that's a really interesting point about you know that that practices need to be engaging more and recognize that, you know, when you're taking on part ones, part twos, they've come out of a, a design thinking environment. They're not necessarily, you know, they haven't been trained to do um, the, the information work. You know, from the, from the other side, when I talk to practices, um, they're very reluctant to hire part ones, part twos, because financially it doesn't make sense because, you know, particularly in a small practice and small practices are out there, you know, fighting tooth and nail with low fees that are ever being, you know, being forced down. And there are other industries and disciplines that are basically are training people to be inf information producers yeah. and businesses that are set up 100% like that to deliver a service in the context of, you know, architecture exists as a, as a kind of cog in a bigger machine of, of building production. And so those, those in this, in the kind of capitalist business sense of it, end up driving a service which is much more affordable on the short term for or perceived to be affordable in the short term by a client that can kind of make it very difficult for architecture practices to to compete particularly on the smaller scale where you know a lot of architects will have you know set up practices because they're disillusioned at working in a larger practice and doing bigger stuff and want to be more creative and do the things that you know that we're talking about here like having time to reflect and research and design and then quickly fall into this trap of like oh my goodness fees yeah yeah this is exactly. like 
like well, how, how do we how do we do this As, which which leads back to another question of in the process of, of architecture school is that there is no conversation really about business or the no. business aspects of it like selling marketing or understanding and I always found that very interesting because you know as an architect we in training we get to think about all the different constraints of a, what can make a, a building you know we talk about technological constraints we even talk about political gender constraints we talk about um, environmental constraints and we get to become very skilled at articulating and choreographing our designs to match these but very rarely do we ever discuss financial constraints inside of a inside of a theoretical project and actually talking about financial constraints inside of a theoretical project is probably the best place to do it because then you can take a you know you can start to play with ideas if you like and start to yeah. speculate well why why do you think that is kind of that culture in university and and practice how do you see that kind of resolving itself i mean i think i think the it's probably a bigger thing that that um some architects try and kind of downplay the importance or aspect of, of money and i don't i don't mean that in the sense of making money i mm. mean that in the sense of dealing with budgets and and also the, the simple fact of trying to keep your office door open and, and not, not, not closed. Mm. Um, and I think you're right, if, if, if students were more aware of these things, because in practice, to be honest with you, I've found that, that pretty much everything revolves around money. Um, it's, it, it, money affects um, the, the budget. Um, if you've got a... a obviously material choices, um, scale, proportion, um, economy of, of uh, trying to make sure that, that you minimize wastage and, and things like that. But also on a, on a more personal level, um, sometimes you become as, as a young architect, the victim of, of uh, financial uh, kind of issues that maybe practice are having and, and yes. I mean I, I've I, I, there's a kind of story in the book but, um, of I worked at a, a large practice and I was effectively um, employed as project architect and I was only 27 at the time but I was employed as, as project architect on on two uh, projects and uh, I only found out after maybe about six months of working about 70 hours a week that uh, the uh, the my project director has, had actually told the client that I was full time on each of the projects, and, right. and when I realised that, I, I just I, uh, I, it was the, it was a client that effectively realised that because yeah. I was on a building site, he could hear the cranes and and the the alarms, and he was on the other building site, and he was saying, "Where where where are you? You're not you're not here." So, um, I think if students realized a bit more about both the budget um, and maybe had design projects where they were actually dealing with uh, probably the most important factor of design and practice um, or not, not, not factor of design, but the, the thing that impacts the design the most, I think is, is money in my experience. Um, they could deal with that better, but also if they understood how, how, uh, bees were uh, structured. Uh, what? What? And and yeah, th th there is in professional practice. We do talk about these things. Uh, so in the professional practice courses in architecture school, these things are introduced. They are they are spoken about, but they are not embedded in a project. They're not uh, something that you actually act out and and deal with. It's it's just information that you're shown. Mm. And you're not taught to really apply it. Um, so, but I mean, to be fair, the the the, the, uh, the Macintosh we run a a project in year three um, where there is a, a real uh, budget where the, and we we engage with quantity surveyors um, and structural engineering students, and it's a it's a collaborative project, and I think that really allows the students to understand that um, in the real world you have to deal with these these 
constraints. But actually, what the, what the students end up finding, in my experience uh, from, from teaching the course, is that their designs actually usually become a bit more efficient and mm -hmm. leaner and more elegant, actually, because they're having to juggle these these constraints and they're not, it's not a complete tap carte blanche um, because no architecture project in practice has uh, is free of, of constraints. So I think some a lot of the students you see a real light, light bulb moment where they think, right, okay, maybe maybe these constraints can actually improve the quality of, of what I'm designing here. Um, and I think that moment needs to be fostered a bit more in, in, in architecture school. Absolutely. And that's really interesting as well, that, uh, Mac, that um, you're actually having students design with other students from different disciplines. Because yeah. that's, again, that's another element of education what often gets missed is that we were kind of you know and again there's there's a lot of practicalities to this and I, i've when i've spoken to design tutors in the past about group work and you know it happens with varying levels of disc of, of of success and often people don't like working with each other and etc cetera, etc cetera. but actually in practice the main thing is that yeah now you are working with four or five different consultants from different disciplines as well as other architects and they're all actually contributing to the to to this design. Um, how does that work in at, at the Macintosh? I love I love the fact that people are doing that. That's it's 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 been running for a long time as well. It's been running for I think um, about ten to fifteen years, if, if not more. So um, I think they they really have pioneered this. It comes from the fact that they're also part of the the art school is also part of the wider Glasgow University mm. who have a structural engineer, uh, structural engineering courses and quantity, uh, well, the quantity severe courses come, come uh, students come from a, another uh, nearby university as well. So it's a real kind of collaborative effort. And I must say, um, I've only, I've only taught it, taught it once, um, but it was a real kind of epiphany for me to see the students grapple with these, these issues and and if i like you say the main thing is collaboration because i think there's too much emphasis in architecture school that, that you are some independent creator of of things when actually you will never ever ever uh, work on your own on anything even if you're a sole practitioner there will always be you need to you need an engineer you need someone to cost it you will need obviously a builder to, to build it mm -hmm. um, so we need to introduce more of that that aspect of being able to to take on other people's concerns and agendas because in reality when you're in practice no one other than the architect uh barring a few good engineers and and good clients really cares too much about the same things that you you maybe care most about so i think Understanding that from an early age and, and the and the projects like like they run at the Mac is really essential and it, it, it is it's a successful project and and I think the structural engineers um, benefit from it as well um, as as do the the quantity surveyors and I'm always reminded by I think it was of of Arup um, a quote where he said that when when uh, structural engineers and quantity surveyors start talking about aesthetics and, and architects start talking about um, technicalities and, and, and uh, the budget, then, then we're getting somewhere. So it really, it really allows both of these worlds to, to kind of combine before they're tested in, in, in reality. Mm. So it, it, I think the one the one missing link um, I think for me is to involve actual tradespeople and contractors because that's a, that's another level of difficulty to yeah. deal with when you're a young architect and and you've got someone with a, a hammer and a chisel asking you what you want them to do and you don't have a clue <laughs> you're, just, you're you're sitting there thinking. You've never built anything in your life. You've never, uh, you've never got your hands dirty, and and I almost felt like a bit of a fraud when 
I just came fresh out of architecture school and I, wo- I worked in a relatively small practice so I was in, and I was involved in a, a project on site and I was effectively running the project and, and be being asked to give the contractor instructions and I just felt like I had no authority to, to do that and I had a very very supportive office who, who, who really helped me through that, that process but yeah, I think some sort of engagement with actual building trades as well, uh, as well as engineers and quantity surveyors would really benefit architecture students. Yeah, absolutely. And it's kind of, you know, the experience of seeing and being on a building site, which mm. is, which even, even in practice is not easy to get that experience. No, no it's not at all. Um, I was very, very lucky that, that the first, project that I was involved on in after graduating was was effectively the whole period we, we, was on site um, and the amount of things I learned in such a short period of time uh, I'm really really grateful for um, and it, it just allowed me right away to to understand the the differences between between what what you think is is, is uh, what should happen and what actually can happen, um, and I learned the hard way. Made a lot of lot of mistakes, um, but yeah, it, it, was a, it was a great experience. And and I, and I think, whereas some of my fellow students who graduated graduated at the time um, didn't quite get that that hands on experience, and usually that was because they maybe went to bigger offices where uh, they were slightly more detached from from the day-to-day running of the, the project and um, so yeah I mean th- that getting that experience is is, is quite rare early on and um, but just being able to see how things were done and how they were like I think that moment when you draw a detail and you actually turn up on site maybe a week later and you see that detail built is is really quite eye opening. Yeah. One because you you're finally realizing that what you draw maybe in an abstract two dimensional plan or section is a real thing. It's it's you can touch it, you can smell it, you can you can you can see it. Um, but also that some of the information that you produced as an architect maybe wasn't quite enough to get across your exact intentions and that you can only really do that uh, by creating a dialogue between you and the and the builder and, and trying to get on the same footing so that, mm. that you both uh, can get what you want, I suppose. Um, oh, just to go back to some of the, the, the elements that you had in the book, and you mentioned there that you've, you've got a, a section in the book dedicated to working conditions. What were some of the findings that you that you found there? In in terms of statistics and, and things like that, or yeah, well, I mean, I think, and, and also like experiences that maybe that you've yeah, heard I mean, from. A, a lot of it came from my own experience, um, but then from from. From starting from my own experience, uh, I think I quickly realised. Obviously, I, I knew I wasn't alone because I've worked in big offices where where other people are, are doing the same thing. But I think, um, I think one one of the first things to say, um, which I think is always really important, is that everything needs to be put into context. I mean, um, I think I mentioned in the book that. If you were an architect in the medieval ages, uh, you probably had it a bit worse than we do at the moment. Um, if you did a good job, you could risk either being blinded or, or having your hands chopped off so that you didn't repeat the same good job again for, for someone else. Um, and then and I think in ancient Greece as well, I found out through my, through my research uh, that you... An architect actually had to uh, basically put up all their possessions uh, and wealth um, as insurance 
for if the if the project either went over budget or it, it, it extended past the time that it was supposed to be completed. And I just kept thinking, wow, there would be no architects anywhere if that if that was the case now. So I think I think you, you have to put the current situation in, into perspective. Yeah. In, in previous life of the architect, we've maybe had it had it a bit worse than we do now. But that's not to say that that um, there isn't a problem. Um, and I think through my own experience of of I mean, just so many stories of, of just crazy situations you, you find yourself in. So I mean, I remember I, I remember um, working late on a Friday evening. It was maybe about eleven o'clock. And I'm playing quite loud music just to just to get myself through the task that I was doing, and and uh, and next minute I just hear banging on the window, and there's there's this crowd of people who are drunk on a night out, uh, dancing away in, in the in the window. We had a we had a shop front, um, and then other times where where I've I've like walked home at four o'clock in the morning after like a, a 20 hour shift. And um, mm. so I think a lot of it, it was quite a cathartic process actually um, remembering these things because as an architect, there's an attitude that what you do is really entangled with your, your, uh, your personal life as well. So what you do professionally becomes part of you personally as well. And I think, that that can be a good thing, but there's also a dangerous side to that, I think, as well, where, where you end up doing things uh, because you feel like you should rather than uh, whether rather than if it's if it's the right thing to do. Um, and I think one of the encouraging things for me, I mean, I, I don't know if you know the, the architect uh, Kate McIntosh, um, modernist um, architect, but, but she she worked um, a long time in local government. Uh, right. I think it's other and, and and Lambeth. And what she said was that they actually didn't have to ever really worry about their working conditions because it, it was uh, unionized at the time, and it allowed them to just focus on doing what they were employed to do, which was which was design. Um, so I think it's important that, that architects are are happy and 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 in what they do, and that 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 involves giving them the correct level of autonomy, but also making sure that they're not overworked and stressed out. Because how how can you make this good decisions if you are tired and demotivated? Um, and I think what what I found out as well was that these there's becoming a lot more awareness of uh, the issues that that uh, architects deal with, such as you, you've described them there previously mm. at the start of low pay in in, in relation to uh, other professions. And again, we, we need to we need to um, contextualise this. I mean, architects get paid slightly more than paramedics, um, and are we saying we're more important than paramedics? I, I don't think so, especially not in, uh, after the, the, the events of the past 18 months. So I think, but at the same time, compared to lawyers and doctors, the, particularly at the, the entry level, the, the salaries just aren't, aren't, aren't enough. Um, I mean, I think I calculated that the recommended uh, the recommended salary for a part one is actually below the living the living wage. Yeah, which just seems that, that just seems crazy for for someone who has has gone through uh, five years of, of education uh, and uh, that 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 doesn't seem right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think. Um, Working conditions, from my own experience and and backing it up with research, they need to contextualise, but also they need dealt with as, as well. And I think the good the good thing is that you've got people like um, the section of architectural workers uh, who are kind of trying to uh, raise awareness, um, 
and the future architects front as well. And I think the profession has to listen to these 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 students because or these 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 young architects because um, if it doesn't, then I think they're going to be repeating the same things again, where you have uh, people sacrificing personal uh, happiness for their career, and that doesn't that doesn't make for healthy yeah, architects yeah. or or healthy buildings that they that they will eventually design. Absolutely. Do Do you think that there is, you know, maybe an oversaturation of architects? Yeah. So, uh, there's yeah, just there's absolutely. just too many. There's too many schools. There's too, they're producing I, too I, many architects. I completely think that, um, and that comes from uh, data as well. I mean, it was, I think, and it, it, it sounds a bit perver perverse me saying this as an architect and someone who who, who teaches architect uh, future architects, but yeah, the statistics are pretty clear. I mean, in the Victorian age, um, there was there was only a third of the, uh, the amount of architects that there are today. And in the Victorian age, it was just a complete building boom. I mean, it, it was the the, the uh, Industrial Revolution and and, and, uh, and also in the post-war um, building boom, there was much less architects than there are now when mm. we're at a time of relative, compared to those two periods, relative stagnation and I think it also comes back to the point that we were talking about earlier uh, where because there are so many architects they end up being given jobs that that someone who wasn't an architect could do and um, so preparing schedules or uh, just I suppose, very repetitive tasks yes. um, and that then creates disgruntled architects, I think. Um, so I think, and also the other thing that, that too many architects does is it keeps the the wages low as well yep. for architects. So I think it, it's a it's a slightly controversial position to take as, as someone who 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 is an architect and a, and a and a teacher of architect or an educator of architects. But I do. I do think, and and the the stats back it up that there are there are just too many architects. Well, I I think this is a very refreshing perspective, and you know, it's basic supply and demand in economics is that there is an over there is an oversupply of architects, which makes it very difficult to have very you know it, you're now forcing everything into commodity. Basically, yeah. we've we've created that we've we've commoditized our our services, if you like, by having such a, a wide um, supply of architects. What you do about that, though, is I don't know. That's a that's a, a difficult that's a difficult <laughs> so, question. That, that, that is million dollars. Do, do you actively encourage people to stop being architects? Do you, or you know, or or do we start at university? I mean, this is another discussion. Is that you know, at university we are being trained to think like an architect. And actually to think like an architect is a powerful tool that doesn't necessarily need to be best rewarded in architectural practice. And actually we're seeing students and people moving into other disciplines, particularly in IT, where the status of architecture, you know, outside of the profession, architecture and being an architect still has a, a high standing in society and is widely acknowledged. And, and certain disciplines, um, you know, software, unit user experience, you know, people yeah. are making these kinds of crossovers quite successfully. Um, and, yeah. and, and a lot of these emerging industries don't have any form of standards or structure, if you like. So actually coming from an architectural education is, is very good. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think you've really hit the nail on, on the head there in terms of what might happen in the future, is that it will be less that architects go down that, that uh, pretty straight, career path where they do their part one, they finish the final couple of years and then they go out into practice, spend a couple of years learning how to do things, then become an associate, then maybe a director in 15 years. I think those patterns are becoming more and more uh, scarce. Um, mm. I think that it, it 
it's becoming a lot more fluid. And again, it, com it comes from wider, wider issues uh, with the economy and, and uh, the kind of fragmentation of, of all industries, really, um, or lots, lots of industries. And I think you're right. I think, I think uh, that architects might become involved in other things. Um, and I see, I, I've seen that already uh, through some of my friends uh, who, has, who have studied with. Some, some became uh, construction managers, uh, some became costume designers, some became... So it, it does, and that, that's why, to go, to go back to the, the earlier discussions we had uh, about providing a... Making sure that, especially in those first three years, that you give a, a wide broad view of architecture, um, I think is going to become more and more crucial because there'll be less opportunities, I think, for architects to, to go down that, that standard career path and more opportunities for them to diversify. I mean, I diversify a bit, but it's in a quite classical way in terms of I write about architecture, I teach architecture and I practice architecture. Um, that's that's not uh, doing much different to, to what what's happened in the past hundred years or so. But I think yeah. starting to see a lot more young architects become involved in lots of different other fields um, and applying their architectural thinking to to other other situations. Um, and I think, as you say, that 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 could be the future direction for the profession. It's less about producing information, but more about thinking um, in those early years as well. Brilliant. I think that's the, the perfect place to conclude the conversation. James, thank you so much for your insights and really multifaceted perspective on the industry um, and being able to give a very balanced look at all the different in you know the, the kind of issues facing both practice and university and kind of starting to paint a picture of how a bridge a more effective bridge can be um established yeah. so. i mean no th thank thank you very much I, just really intelligent questions you, you made it you made it easy easy <laughs> easy for me i think so yeah My no, pleasure. i really appreciate your your time um and i think i think really happy with the, the things you discussed today and I think I'm quite an open and honest person and I, I, I don't uh, I'm glad that we touched on some potentially controversial <laughs> issues like um, there being less architects because it, it's something I've had in my head for a while but I don't I don't ever really tell too many people about yeah. it because I know that it's kind of a conflict of of uh, what I'm paid to do, but but I mean I think I think uh, yeah, great discussion. Really really enjoyed it. Um, Brilliant. Thank you again. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.